Thanks, Roit, and uh, thanks for inviting me to speak a little bit about my research. So uh, this represents some work that I did uh, back in Uppsala before I moved here, uh, together with my then PhD student, Andrea Gana, who is now a postdoc at um, the Broad Institute. So it's a, this is a, one of the first use examples of uh, data from the UK Biobank, I think. We started about three, four years ago, and we published last year in The Lancet. It's in the study of mortality prediction. So death, obviously we can't avoid it, but, and there's no question about that, but there is a question about when it's gonna go occur, and that's something that has been very interesting to all humans throughout history, and is obviously interesting for a clinician. You wanna uh, make a good prognosis, a good prediction of what, whether your patient is likely to die within the next year or five years or, 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 or whenever, and it's also very important for the patient, obviously, because you can make some decisions regarding how to live your life. It turns out, and I'm going to get back to that, it's very interesting also for, for just healthy individuals in the general population. We had a huge interest for our work. And, and again, it's, it's interesting for anyone to get a better idea of your risk of dying in the next years or risk of a disease. And it's also actually interesting for governmental agencies because you can actually tailor, tailor your policy decisions and things like that based on, on mortality risk in different uh, strata of the, of the population. So uh, we use the UK Biobank, and as I think is already becoming clear, it's much more than just a repository of samples. In fact, it's a very rich uh, longitudinal cohort study with a lot of different data. And in this case, we used uh, more or less the whole UK Biobank. We excluded a couple of thousand individuals because they didn't have complete data. So we had, uh, we, in this study, we included 498,103 individuals. They were between 37 and 73 years old and they were 54% uh, were women. And we studied 655 different variables. So that was all variables that were available uh, at that time when we did this study. And we looked at them in relation to mortality over five years, and we had a little bit more than 8,500 deaths. And uh, the predictors that we looked at in relation to mortality, they came from a lot of different areas. There were some that were kind of health history factors, some that had to do with environment and lifestyle, um, some that were direct measures of health, like blood pressure or from spirometry and, and um, uh, um, uh, BMD and, and uh, bone density and stuff like that. We had factors on early life. We had factors from social demographics. We had cognitive function measures, uh, sex-specific factors, uh, social, uh, psychosocial factors, uh, some family history. In this case, we didn't have the DNA yet because that wasn't done, but, but self-reported family history, and some initial blood sampling. And, and in this case, it was really just a blood count because all of the other biomarkers weren't available at the time we did this study. So we looked at the association between all of these factors, it was 655 variables in total, and mortality risk. And it's important to point out here that this is prediction. So it hasn't, has, doesn't have anything to do with, with causality. We didn't even try to adjust for potential confounders like we do in epidemiology. This was a pure, pure prediction exercise. Uh, so what were the take-home messages? Well, the first was that the self-reported factors were really the strongest predictors, both in males and females. So as you can see in this slide, where on the y-axis you have the uh, C-index, which is a measure of discrimination, where 0 0.5 is random, 1 is perfect discrimination. So the strongest predictors were really things that you just report yourself, like your overall health rating, a question, how do you rate your own health? Excellent, good, poor. Uh, and other things that have to do with social demographics or with diseases. And that was also true in women, where uh, cancers were the strongest predictors. Uh, we also saw that the risk prediction differed a bit between men and women, uh, although most of the measures were quite similar. You see the, the dots that end up on this line, they are similar in men and women, whereas there were some, like cancer, that had stronger predictive capability in women, while some, like physical activity and, and the blood count, were stronger predictors in males. The third take-home message was that smoking is still the strongest predictor uh, of, of, of future mortality in previously healthy. So we did a subset of individuals where we excluded all individuals that had any previous disease. It was still a very large subset of about more than 300,000 individuals. And here, smoking was the strongest predictor, both in males and especially in females. 
Now, in addition to publishing this uh, in, in the Lancet last summer, we built a web page to disseminate our results. And, and the reasons for doing that was both that we wanted to more in an interactive, in a more complete way, show all the results for the scientific community, because it's, as you know, hard to kind of digest everything in a one journal article. But we also wanted to spread our results to the broader community, to just regular citizens. And, and then we managed to do that uh, by creating this uh, website. And indeed, we had 3.4 million visitors in the first three days. It was a huge interest. I had interviews. We had three, 400 media outlets uh, interviewing. And so it's very, very a huge interest for this uh, for this project. It has two parts, this web page that you can go in and look at if you want. The left part, the association explorer, there you will see kind of all of our associations. In the right part, there you can fill out your own data, and it's a risk calculator. So it's basically uh, 13 questions for a male and 11 for a woman. woman. It's based on our study, on the risk equation that we also published in the Lancet paper. And the left part looks a little bit like this. It looks very similar to the paper, where you have all of the dots represent the variable. You can select different causes of death here. So you can, if you're spe specifically interested in cancer, for example, you can go in and look at predictors for cancer. You can search. You can look in different categories. And if you click on one of the dots, in this case, usual walking pace, you'll get much more information. You'll see all of the associations. So these are from Cox regressions. You see the hazard ratios. You see the number of deaths. You see the p-values in different age categories. In the other part, the risk equation part, the risk calculator, that you respond to questions like this. These are all phrased in exactly the same way as they were phrased in the UK Biobank. So in this case, how would you describe your usual walking pace? And you select your responses. And, and after that, you end up at a result page like, looking like this. So this is my result. Uh, so you get your five-year uh, five risk of dying. In my case, it's 0.3%. And we uh, try to represent it in a way which is a little bit easier to digest. So um, the figure here is basically showing that among 100 men that are of my age, 41, that have my risk, 0.3%, less than one is likely to die in the next five years. Uh, we also calculate this double age, and that is the age where my risk, 0.3, is the average risk for someone who is a male in UK. So in my case, 0.3% represent the average risk for someone who's 23 years old in the UK. Uh, and you also get a confidence interval there. And some in the media, they, they try to uh, phrase this as a biological age. That's another way of looking at it. It's not entirely correct because it has some other connotations. But we call it double age. Uh, just uh, want to wrap up with uh, a couple of, of uh, pointers to what I'm planning in the next few years using UK Biobank. So as already Martin already referred to, this is a great resource open just to write a proposal and you'll get the data. So we have a lot of things going on in my group. Uh, we're going to do uh, some additional work on the Abel. Uh, we're going to uh, we're now um, trying to translate all of the findings to uh, U.S. population. So we're recalibrating. We're testing things here. And this is work I'm doing together with Nick. I'm sure here at Stanford. Uh, we are uh, using new kinds of modeling to improve the prediction. We're trying to take into account mo modifiable exposures. So you not only get your risk, but also how you can change it. And we're also extending the, the follow-up time now as the follow-up time in UK Biobank extends. We're also including a lot of new predictors like genetics, biomarkers, and stuff things like that. Uh, I'm also working with a lot of other projects. And, and my main area is cardiovascular disease. But, but, and I've been mostly focused on my carlin function. But with UK Biobank, you also have a lot of other traits. Because it's so huge, it's half a million individuals, you can actually start looking at some more rare diseases. And that's something we're doing. And we're working both with genetics. We're actually even going back and doing some GWAS, genome-wide decision studies that I've been doing in the past, not so much in the past one, two years. But now we're going back because there are some refined, new, very nice phenotypes which haven't been possible to look at before. I'm also working with more traditional epidemiological studies, observational studies. And what I'm particularly excited about right now is the marriage of genetics and epidemiology in something we call Mendel randomization, where we can use genetics as a way of trying to get at causality. Uh, so with that, I'd like to close. And I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks.